We are delighted to welcome you to a, a new series of lessons. This series is on imagination. And we believe imagination to be a hidden force of human destiny. We say hidden because we use it and we don't realize it. And some use it to grow and to be blessed. Others use it to destroy themselves. And so we want you to understand imagination. The human person, whether he's a spirit, soul, and a body, the human person is so wonderfully and mysteriously made by God that it is possible that science will never completely understand the intricacies of the inside of a human person, and maybe not the body either. Imagination is one of those sources of life that we can become involved in. In the birth of human imagination, it positively and definitely was placed in the, the, the human person by God and Adam first. And we will be going back to that. And we discover, like for example, in Genesis chapter 6, and that, that's only six pages from the beginning of man, you see. In verse 5, it says, God saw the wickedness of man. That is, wickedness was great in the earth. Now watch carefully. And every imagination of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. Now right in the first of the Bible, <laughs> only got six chapters into the Bible, we, we, we get the picture of imagination, the, po the potential of imagination, where it says God saw it, that every imagination of the thoughts. So God has said man has imagination, it originates in his thoughts, you see, and that uh, we're only evil continually, uh, that, that he had turned it into a negative structure rather than into a positive structure. He could have turned it back to knowing God, you see, and, and have, uh, you know, have used it successfully in a recovering of the Garden of Eden. But rather than that, man used his powers and force and, and, and dignity of imagination in a negative manner. Now, you know, just five chapters later, in, in Genesis chapter 11, that's what you call the antediluvian time before the flood. Now, in, in these short chapters, we come to the post-diluvian period. It says in Genesis eleven six, Jehovah said, Behold, the people is one, is one. And they all have one language. And this they begin to do. And now, now, now watch carefully, nothing will re be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. <laughs> what a, what an amazing look and view and interpretation of what the word imagination means. And that's God said, because of the unity of the people and of the language and of the forces of imagination, <laughs> that they could bring it into being, imagine it and then do it, that there would be nothing that could restrain them. That means it's unlimited in your powers of imagination, unlimited. Every intricate development in science first begins as an imagination, and then it flows into reality and flows into being to bless. And, and that's the way God saw these people. So God said, when a man is not restrained, he says, and nothing will be, will be restrained from them. You see? So God says there has to be restraint on imagination. Otherwise, man can do anything he imagines to do. <laughs> That's powerful. That if you can imagine it, you can do it. 
when you say, I, I see it, then you can do it. Your, uh, your abilities are really not according to your learning, to your education. Your abilities are according to your imagination. If you can see it, bring it into being, from an inside of you, some of the greatest inventors were not people educated in colleges. In fact, some of the greatest professors were not, were not, were not educated in college. They, they, they assembled their knowledge and put it in store and began to teach others. And so that's your imagination. Uh, be part of your, your great being. In our daily intercourse of people, we often hear people say, just imagine. <laughs> they, they mean it's almost unbelievable, but evidently it's true. You, you've heard people say, can you imagine that? They mean, can your mind expand to receive and accept what seems to be impossible? You heard people say, now he's got imagination. And he's speaking of an achievement someone has accomplished beyond normal human thinking. Sometimes a person is asked, can you do this? Oh, I imagine I can. You'd be amazed at how often we use the word imagine and imagination. But we use it with such triviality that we don't actually understand the force of it, the strength of it, the potential of it, that we can utilize it to bless humanity or curse humanity if it's used the wrong way. I, I just can't forget that in Japan, the first time I was there many years ago, they told me how cigarettes got, got to be used in Japan. And they said that uh, uh, a missionary was walking through a uh, hospital, giving out tracts, and gave one out about cigarettes, a tract about cigarettes. Told all about them. And this Japanese man that was sick read it. He said, man, says, i never seen one, but this is a way to get rich. And from that hospital bed, he started the first cigarette company over, over in Japan. Someone handed him a piece of paper and his powers of imagination, he hadn't seen one yet, went into force. And he said, yeah, that's a way to make money. And he learned how to produce cigarettes and how to sell them and became a very wealthy man. They could have they could have told him about something good, <laughs> McDonald's hamburgers, and he could have made a million on that too. But on that hospital bed, it's where this powers of imagination focused in on getting wealthy by this thing. And so the, really the missionary didn't do him much service by giving him such a track when, when he didn't know what they were talking about. He hadn't seen one. But in, anyway, we use the word imagine so easy. Can you do this? Oh, imagine, I could. This means from the inside of us, there's a force that goes into operation that creates an image that says, yeah, I, I can do that. Though I haven't been trained to do it, I can learn to do it. I can do it. And so these experiences show how man lives in a world of fancy where imagination is born. Your imagination spans the, the past across to the future, and you live in the midst of it in a great world of Im imagery that you can say, I saw it. I will see it, and I have it uh, to live in. You say, what is this imagination you're talking about? Human imagination is a function of the conscious mind, your conscious mind. It is not from your subliminal mind, which is your unconscious mind. Nor is it your nocturnal, nighttime, dream world mind. It, it is not there. Imagination is a deliberate action. You call it into being. And oftentimes it is a fulfillment, your imagination is a fulfillment of hidden desires that want to come out, that want to be expressed. And your imagination, a little girl imagines she is a mother, you see, and because inside of her she has a hidden desire that one day she will be a mother.
You reach into your world of imagination and, and, and you bring to fruition the inner desires of the total human person. Imagination is deeply related to that which is inside of you looking for fulfillment. So imagination and fulfillment flow together. Imagination is the projected image out of the world of hope and maybe out of the world of faith. A projected image wanting to come into the area to break down the wall of partition and come into the world of reality from the world of unreality. Naturally, uh, you know, uh, an evolutionist would say, well, uh, this power of imagination uh, grew in man and so forth. I, I don't believe that. I think that God uh, created imagination and gave it to man and maybe that those people before the flood, like Adam and, and Enoch and, and Noah, had greater powers of imagination than anyone has ever had since. I would say that imagination is running down rather than running up. I would say that imagination is on the decrease rather than the increase. And, and so it isn't something that evolved. Imagination is a gift of God to be used and and, and uh, be used spiritually. It was created for godly purposes by the Creator. It was created for a man to use here on planet Earth. There would be no imagination in heaven. There would be fulfillment, total fulfillment of all the things you have imagined. Only further, man has not conceived in his mind the thing that God has prepared for him. His wildest imaginations hasn't conceived what God has prepared for him. And so you won't need imagination. You will have reality at that time. God endowed man with his creativity. Everything that has been made by man that you can observe on the face of this earth was first in the world of imagery before it got into the world of reality. It had to come first from the world of imagination before you get it into the world of creation to where you create it and bring it into being. So Adam and Eve were the first ones to have the activities of their mind, and it included all of their imaginal forces. And they were responsible for these imaginal forces, just as they were conscious uh, that, they, that they were responsible for the decisions that they made. So no one can say, I'm not responsible for the things I imagine. <laughs> no, that is not true. You are responsible for the things you imagine because it is a deliberate action of a human person. And you, you give yourself over to it to imagine these things. And if you permit yourself to imagine wrong, then the devil helps you to go deeper into the wrong imagination. And if you wish to imagine right, the Bible and God and Jesus, the angels, all help you to move into the right and correct imaginal world. Imagination is a power to conceive, to give expression to, images and realities which can be moved from that world into your world, material, mundane world that you live in. Imagination in itself has no real existence except in the mind. It has no evidence, you see, to produce. It is in a world that cannot be seen or heard. It has to come out of your heart out of your insides in order for you to understand all the things you have imagined. This means, <laughs> and you have to get to this, when Satan saw that man had this great power, and, and he, of course he had it too. He, he imagined himself to be over God one day. And the, the battle for imagination began in the Garden of Eden. Let's look at it again. Open your Bible there to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6. Now you're on the second page of the Bible trying to show you that what we're talking about is not new and not novel. It has been with man always and needs to be taught clearly so that everyone will understand why they do certain things. In Genesis 3 and 6, it says, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And also she gave to her husband and he did eat. So we look at the story. And this is the way it goes. Uh, Satan, the devil, brought her close to the tree 
and says, Eve, look at this tree. So she saw the fruit of that tree. Now, this was a material, physical situation altogether. She looked upon it with her eyes. The Bible doesn't say so, but I am sure she felt it. <laughs> well, knowing humans today, uh, she, she, she had a, a, a contact with it. She, at least she saw it and possibly she could feel it. And uh, maybe she measured it, you know, to see just how big it was. It was real, real fruit. And there's no doubt about it. And, and she looked upon it with her eyes. Then from the inside of this woman called Eve, without tasting the fruit, she believed it was delicious. Now that takes imagination. Now you don't know apple pie is really good until you bite it. It might look good, but that don't make it good. Because if the cook were to put salt, and I went to a house one time that that had happened, mistook sugar for salt, and you have never tasted anything so crazy as apple pie full of salt. You got it made. It's as if you took water out of the sea and put in it. To put salt in the pie rather than sugar, it wouldn't be good. And nobody, nobody would eat it. It just looks good. <laughs> it looked as good as any other apple pie, excepting it has salt in it. And nobody ate it. It went into the garbage. Even the dog didn't want it. Now you can pass by the window of a store or, or a bakery, for example. You can see something in there that looks real good, like, like a freshly made cake. And you can say, hmm. I'd like to have a bite of that. But in our modern world today, they make those things out of plastic for setting in shore windows. So if you were to bite down on it, you'd discover it was plastic. It only looked like a cake. And what an awful expression you'd have bringing up your broken teeth off of a piece of plastic. It wasn't really good. So he had not tasted. She didn't know what it was. She just saw it. But she believed the devil. Eve believed the devil. She conceived within her mental powers that what she saw with her eyes would also be delicious to her taste. And they are two different functions between eyes and taste. Eve had no evidence that the fruit was delicious. It could have been briny. It could have been awful tasting. She had never had any. Eve said, it is pleasant to my eyes. I am sure it will be pleasant to my taste. Then Eve went a step further. She believed Lucifer, or the devil who was talking to her, that this tree also had a power, strange power, that would make you wise. Now that's another world. And then that's left the apple pie world and gone into a world of, uh, of intelligence, you see. <laughs> now, and the apple pie would make you wise, you see? I, they used to say, if you eat fish, you'll get wise. And immediately I said, well, in that case, there ought to be a, a lot of fishermen that have been presidents. A lot of fishermen should be governors. And, and it, a lot of fishermen should be bankers. And you see, that runs, out of, that runs into nonsense. And so here you, you, you see the story. And she says, this will make me wise. No, apple pie won't make you wise. It'll make you fat. You see, not wise. It goes one way, not the other way. You see. Now, Eve had gotten this fruit inside her world of imagination. Not only for her lips was this good, but now she was saying for her brain it was good. You see what imagination can do for you? Eve hit a whole world of unreality. You can't eat fruit for brain food. <laughs> And Eve's fanciful world, she had gotten into what she said. If I eat this fruit, I'll be smarter than Adam. And man, that's an achievement. Yeah, that's where she was working. No doubt a great battle surged within her. It wasn't an instant thing. To rule over her mind. To rise up. Because it also said, can you imagine? And you should be like God. And you should be like God. Whew, that's bigger than Adam. She'd seen God walk in the garden in the evening times with Adam, and she knew him. Imagination was a key force. Put a circle around that. Imagination was a key force 
that caused that situation and condition uh, to come into fruition. We must remember, man was created for imagination. God did it, you know. Take for example, little children lead all mankind in imagination. We sometimes lose it through the mundane operations of working with our hands and our feet and our brain. We lose this force that's innate in a child's life. And, and we shouldn't lose it. Imagination should stay with us as long as we live on the face of this earth. For example, a little girl, uh, she can take a rag. And, and, and even though it might be a dishcloth, she can call it a doll. Nobody can do it but her. She sees what nobody else sees in that rag. She feels that what nobody else can feel in that rag. The rag becomes a baby. <laughs> yeah. In her world of imagination, she gives it a name. She plays and she loves a rag that it comes from a doll to a baby. A boy, on the other hand, can take a broomstick, like I did when I was a boy, and call it a horse. And he rides that horse. He yells out orders to that horse. He wears himself out running here and forth. <laughs> what he realizes is the horse is not carrying him. He's carrying a horse. But in a boy's imagination, that doesn't matter anyway. You can say, son, what are you doing? What do you have there? He'll say, daddy, I have a horse. But you say, son, and that's the world of imagination. And he says, oh, no, I really have a horse. You see, children, children can take wooden blocks. They can put them together. They can call it a train. They can take wooden blocks, put them together. They can call it a boat. They can take wooden blocks and put it together. They call it a house because children love imagination. You don't have to put it in there. God's already put it in there. And it can be a great asset, a great asset. I heard uh, one time of a little boy who came walking into his house one afternoon. He says, hey, mommy, there's a lion out there in our yard. And the mother said, now, nah, son, there, there's, there, there's no lion out there. Yes, mama, there is a lion out there in our yard. I just saw that lion. I know there's a lion there. She said, now, nah, son, you know we have a dog, and you know our dog is in the yard, and you know for sure there is no lion in that yard. She says, son, you know you're not telling the truth. There's no lion there. Yes, mama? I am telling you the truth. There's a lion in our yard. The mother said to the boy, so now listen, son, why don't you go into your bedroom and you kneel down and pray and talk to Jesus about this lion story. So he promptly trails off into his room, kneels by his bed, and in a few minutes comes skipping back in, as joyful and as happy as a boy can be. The mother said, uh, did you talk to Jesus about the lion story? Oh, yes, mama. I talked to Jesus about it. Well, what did Jesus have to say? He says, Mom, he says, I was talking to Jesus about it, and Jesus said to me, he says, you know, you know, he says, I thought it was a lion too when I first saw it. And he went skipping back out in the yard. Can you imagine that he imagined in his room how to answer his mother? And that Jesus, the first, he knew it wasn't a lion, but that Jesus, when he first thought it, he was a lion. He says, yeah, I saw it. I thought it was a lion too when I first saw it. And he goes skipping out to play. J children uh, get smart real, real young. <laughs> yeah. Our world of imagination is a powerful world. And in that world of imagination, God wants you and me to turn that power, that force into something big, into something good, and into something wonderful. I wish you would... Mark your place right there, because I, I would like to continue uh, this, the birth of human imagination in our, in our next study. And, and uh, we will move into it in a much stronger and, and broader way. Many of you will say, Brother Sumrall, I must hear this again, and I want you to hear it several times. You can get it in an audio tape. I hope that you'll order it today, that you won't, you won't delay at all. This can change your life. You can understand that your imaginations are not bad and not wrong if you just channel them in the proper way. That's all that God requires of us is channel them in the proper way. Across our land today, many people are, 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 are purchasing a video players. Sometimes they do it for a group, for a prayer meeting, for a, a study group, 
sometimes for a Bible college, and oftentimes for the family. And you can re receive this lesson by, by uh, ordering it. And you'll, you'll get either one or two or three or four or however many lessons that you want. But you can certainly get this one. And I would be so glad for you to have it. When you're ordering, if you'd write down this number, that this is number 5202. And if you would like the first one in this order, it's 5201. And this one is 5202. The first one was called, I Have Imagination. This one is the birth of human imagination, part one. And we will have part two uh, following this one. May I bless you. Now, Lord, I am so thrilled and delighted that I can move into an area that can change and transform people's lives. And I am so glad that, that now you are ready to set people free from superstitions and from all sources of evil, that our imagination can be God conscious, that our imagination can be world conscious and changing the world around us for good. So bless my friend right now. And if you don't know the Lord as your Savior, receive him right now and say, come into my heart. The Bible says in 1 John 1 and 1, a 1 and 9, that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness.